are video games art? Now this is a question I'm sure many of you have seen over the years, and if I were to guess, you're probably sick and tired of hearing about it. If you were to ask me, this question is pretty outdated. Games have evolved so much that boiling them down to a simple label is stupid. Some developers are fine with making these gamey ass video games, and others are more interested in exploring the medium in a deeper or unconventional way. Art shouldn't be restricted to some binary checklist for validation, and thankfully most people realize this nowadays. The question shouldn't be our video games art. Rather, it should be what makes video games unique as an art form. You'd think that this would be an easy answer, but most devs have a completely different view on what it should be. Take a look at Sony's recent catalog. It almost feels like they're embarrassed to be labeled as games. They're so focused on trying to capture this faux cinematic experience that they lose out on what makes the medium different from the rest. They're almost ashamed to be games, so they try their hardest to act like something you'd see on the silver screen. Sure, they can have some fun gameplay, but all of them come with plenty of this, this, and this. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate this new trend of AAA games, but they aren't exactly what I'm looking for. You compare something like The Last of Us to the new God of War, and you'll notice that they hit a lot of the same superficial beats. Sure, both of these games are different upon further examination, but because the core backbone of the experience follows the same template, I can't help but feel as though they end up feeling kinda samey. As I said, these games aren't bad, but they're not for me. When I think of games as art, I think of projects with unique creative voices behind them. I think of games that use the interaction that comes with the medium to their advantage, and craft experiences you can't find anywhere else. It was this train of thought that initially led me into discovering what has easily become one of my favorite games, and is a shiny example of the medium at its finest. I know some of you might think I'm a bit crazy, and I get it. No More Heroes is generally remembered as this goofy little action game with a heavy focus on comedy. It might seem like a bit of a stretch to label something so juvenile as art, but what if I told you that behind the layers of stylized violence and humor lies a game about isolation, obsession, and the dangers of escapism? So for today's video, I'm going to be taking a deep dive into this cult classic and finding out why No More Heroes is much smarter than people give it credit for. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you about today's sponsor, Incogni. You know what I love? The internet. But you know what I don't love? The increasing amount of data breaches that are happening on a daily basis. You might not realize it, but there are hundreds of companies out there right now that are buying and selling your personal information. And it goes without saying that they don't exactly have the best interests in mind. For example, advertisers will collect your information and start flooding you with targeted ads. While you are able to reach out to these companies yourself and have this information removed, the issue is that it would take years to contact every one of them on your own. This is where today's sponsor, Incogni comes in for the rescue. Incogni is the latest product from Surfshark that is designed to reach out to these companies on your behalf and have your information wiped from their files. All you have to do is create an account, say whose information you'd like to have removed, and there you go. Incogni will now contact every company with the matching information and get it removed for you. This means that you no longer need to worry about spam emails or robot calls. I know for a fact that I have plenty of accounts on long abandoned gaming forms that are just ripe for the picking. And with Incogni, I don't need to stress out about having this information protected. Best of all, you're able to try it risk-free for the first 30 days to test the waters, and if you like it and want to subscribe, then the first 100 people to click the link in the description or use code COMPENDIUM will get 20% off of Incogni's premium service. Once again, major thanks to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. No More Heroes stars Travis Touchdown, an adult in his late 20s who after winning a beam katana from an internet auction, sets out on a journey to become the number one ranked assassin in Santa Destroy. However, if Travis wants to make it to the top, he needs to cut down the 10 ranked assassins standing in his way. While it might be easy to assume that Travis has some sort of noble goal behind his actions, it's actually the exact opposite. The reason why Travis goes on this killing spree to begin with is so that he could potentially sleep with his employer, Sylvia Crystal. Okay, how about this? If I become number one, will you do it with me? You see, despite Travis's actions and profession, he's actually a shut-in loser. Normally in these types of action games, we have a protagonist that's cooler than cool, whether that be cocky, stoic, seductive, and so on. Our first exposure to Travis is seeing him act with a lot of confidence. He spouts out one-liners and is shown to have faith in his own skills. However, just as we finish up the first mission, the rug is suddenly pulled out from under us. This initially cool and calculated assassin, in reality, is a huge dork who's obsessed with all things anime and 
gaming. He's not on a quest for revenge or to prove himself. All Travis really wants is to get laid. The basic premise of No More Heroes is honestly pretty simple. It's your standard hero's journey. Travis has a goal and the main story follows his journey to achieving it. It's an entertaining story on its own thanks in due part to the clever and hilarious writing and the unique characters he comes across. If you don't really care about the deeper meaning present, you're still gonna at least get something out of No More Heroes, narratively speaking. However, if you're like me, the game's main appeal lies less in its literal storytelling and more so in the game's meta-narrative. As I said at the start of the video, No More Heroes is a game drenched in parody and irony, but if we were to take a step back and look at the broader picture, we have a game that focuses on quite a few themes. However, what I find most impressive about all this is how Suda51 and his team managed to express them in both the story and core gameplay. Let's cover the latter first, since it's the biggest hurdle to overcome. The gameplay experience of No More Heroes can be divided up into two distinct halves, those being the ranked assassin missions and the open world. Since these two facets of gameplay are heavily segmented from each other, it'll be best to just tackle it piece by piece. The core combat of No More Heroes can be described as simple but satisfying. It's more so reminiscent of old school beat-em-ups rather than the more technical action games that came out in the 2000s. This means that while the combat doesn't exactly have the most amount of depth, it's still mindless fun in its own right. The main mechanic of No More Heroes is the death blow system. By lowering an enemy's health bar through a mix of high and low attacks, you'll be able to perform a powerful finishing blow. The one you get changes depending on the attacks used in a combo, and while it might seem basic, there is a little bit of strategy involved. Your finishing attacks are able to hit multiple enemies at once, and since time plays a major factor in your end stage rank, you need to be smart about your positioning. Taking out multiple enemies also serves a secondary benefit. With each enemy killed, you'll spin this slot machine at the bottom of the screen, and if you match three of the same tile, you'll activate a special move. This can range from slowing down time to a crawl, making all your attacks one-hit kills, giving you a powerful projectile move, and you can even earn a screen nuke that instantly kills every enemy in a room. The roulette wheel is an interesting idea, though it's ultimately kinda shallow. It's best to think of it as a bonus reward rather than a core mechanic for you to experiment with. This entirely boils down to the fact that you have zero way to plan around it. Either they happen or they don't. There's no real in-between. Sure, scoring multiple death blows against enemies increases the number of slots that spin, but it's not exactly something that you can always rely on. This is why I classify these more as a bonus reward rather than a key tool in your arsenal. No More Heroes does have a few extra mechanics up its sleeves to spice things up a bit, but I've noticed that a lot of people either don't know that they exist or know how to consistently pull them off. The Dark Step is especially guilty of this. Think of the Dark Step as your perfect dodge move. It's very similar to Bayonetta's Witch Time now that I think about it, but the execution is a lot more clumsy. In that game, all you have to do is tap the dodge button just as an enemy's attack is about to land. It's simple to grasp and is a very intuitive intuitive maneuver. The dodge in No More Heroes doesn't have the same grace. I think what you're supposed to do is tap a direction on the analog stick just as an attack is about to hit you, but it doesn't always work for me. Maybe my timing is off, but I can only get the dark step to work if I press a direction after blocking the attack. Once I started doing it that way, it began to happen more frequently, but it still feels like I'm missing something and I'm not sure what it is. Also, did you know that this game has a parry system? I sure didn't for the longest time. By blocking an enemy's attack just as it's about to hit, they'll become staggered, which can then be followed up by a heavy hitting attack. The parry attack can completely demolish enemy hordes with proper positioning, making it an essential technique for getting good ranks. It goes without saying that this system is a lot more interesting than the Dark Step, since it's something that I can accurately control and activate with enough skill. I'm a simple guy, you put a parry in your game, and I'm probably gonna like it. When it comes to the core mechanics, that's honestly it. No More Heroes has a very straight to the point combat system all things considered. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of the original Devil May Cry with how simple things can be, but let's be real here, even that game has more underlying depth than NMH does. Simple mechanics don't necessarily make a bad combat system, but it does mean that it's a lot easier for the experience to become repetitious, especially in a game like NMH where the more advanced stuff isn't properly explained to the player. Sure, it exists, but without having a lot of curiosity or looking it up online, you'd be hard-pressed to even realize that there is extra depth. It's worth noting that despite the somewhat bare moveset you have access to, the game is designed around using all of it. There are two distinct states to the game's combat, those being the attacking phase and the defending phase. When you're on the offense, you have your high and low attacks, wrestling moves, and death blows, but the more experienced players are still able to dish out damage during the defensive phase. All of this is tied together by the battery system. Nearly every action you take expends some of your battery meter, and once it runs out, you'll be unable to deal any damage. Recharging the beam katana doesn't take too long, just a few strokes and you're ready to go, but it comes with the downside of locking you in place, making you vulnerable to 
attacks. This system alone keeps combat interesting throughout the entire game. The combat flow of Venomage boils down to battery management. You need to decide which attacks are appropriate to use in what scenario, while also finding time to recharge. Do I only stick to using basic attacks, whittling down enemies one by one? Maybe I should use a charge attack to clear out a whole group at once, but at the cost of spending most of my battery. It's micro decisions like this that make every encounter interesting to engage with. And that's not even factoring in whether you're fighting melee or ranged enemies. I'd say the combat is at its best during boss battles. It perfectly demonstrates the careful tightrope walk you have to perform, and allows you to go wild with almost every system in the game, especially if you end up playing on the mild difficulty setting. They're without a doubt the highlight of the game, and each one sticks out in my mind as a fun encounter, whether that be because of their appearance, gameplay gimmick, or a combination of the two. No More Heroes Combat, while simple, manages to be engaging through a combination of smart design and visual flair. The animation of Travis's attacks go a long way in selling their weight and intensity. Death blows in particular feel incredibly satisfying, thanks to the slow motion effect and extra crunchy sound design. Call it style over substance if you want, but good visual flair and auditory design goes a long way in making combat satisfying. Sure, Travis is massacring people in the hundreds, leaving nothing behind except a pile of bodies in a sea of crimson, but hey, at least it looks cool. <laughs> The ranked assassin missions are undoubtedly the most interesting part of No More Heroes gameplay-wise. Sure, they don't have the most amount of depth in the world, but they manage to make up for that in the stylized violence of it all. I think the reason why I'm not nearly as hard on the combat of NMH than I would be for other action games is due to the game's overall structure. Unlike something like DMC or the Xbox Ninja Gaiden games, NMH offers far more gameplay variety to keep things interesting. While I would like for No More Heroes to have the complexity of those titles, understanding that not all the focus is solely placed on the combat allows me to cut the game some slack at the areas where it falters. This brings us to the other half of the gameplay experience, the open world. The open world portions of the first No More Heroes is easily the most contentious part of the experience, and honestly, I don't fully blame people for dropping the game because of it. For those who are unaware, in order to participate in the ranked assassin missions and progress through the story, you need to first pay an ever-increasing entry fee. While you do get a nice chunk of money after completing missions, it isn't nearly enough to fully cover the entry fee for the next fight. So how do you get cash? Well, you got a job. You mow lawns, pick up garbage, fill cars up at the gas station, pretty much any standard minimum wage job you can think of. The payout of each job varies, but all of them also offer some bonus rewards depending on your rank. This is mainly in the form of optional assassin contracts that net you a decent chunk of money upon completion. The open world and part-time jobs have gathered a pretty infamous reputation over the years. People often refer to this segment of the game as filler or as a joke. Oh, classic Suda51, going out of his way to mess with players' expectations again. There's no denying that there are some comedic intentions behind this portion of the game. You buy this goofy action game only to be forced to do your chores before having dessert. Like, come on. But I think that writing this pretty substantial part of the experience off as nothing more than a joke or meaningless content is a bit disingenuous. If you were to ask me, the open world is what ties everything together. You're meant to embody Travis's character and identify with him. There's no better way to do that than let the players themselves experience his life firsthand. Driving around the town yourself and picking up new crappy jobs goes a long way in making Santa Destroy feel real. You end up getting used to this loop as if it's your real job, making the moments where you're able to escape from it all and go back to the combat all the more satisfying. There's a lot that could be said about whether or not developers should sacrifice the gameplay experience for the sake of the narrative. It's a delicate tightrope walk, since you run the risk of potentially frustrating the player if it doesn't turn out well. A standout example to me is the opening hours of Kingdom Hearts 2. In a lot of ways, it's very similar to the open world sections of No More Heroes. You do part-time jobs and get small samples of the combat, and just like NMH, this section of the game was included so you could identify with the protagonist before their whole world comes crashing down. The main difference is that this only lasts for a few hours in KH2's case, while for No More Heroes, it's about half the game. It's one of those things where you either like it or you don't, but if you were to ask me, the game would honestly be worse off without it. When looking at its inclusion from a gameplay standpoint, it serves to break up the potential monotony that comes with the basic combat. If No More Heroes was all combat all the time, then it would get old pretty quickly. Having some moments of reprieve where you can drive around and do something else for a change goes a long way in preventing any potential boredom. It also helps that these minigames aren't even all that bad. Sure, the concept of some of the jobs are pretty stupid, I don't think I've heard anyone get excited about picking up garbage, but they only last for a few minutes. 
and if you really want to stick to the combat, you can still pay your entry fee by doing the assassination missions, so you at least have some options. On the whole, I like the gameplay of No More Heroes. The best way to describe it would be straight to the point. The combat is simplistic, sure, but it's not bogged down by any unnecessary mechanics. While this could run the risk of becoming tiring, the open world serves as a way to break up the formula by offering some minigames to spice things up a bit. If the game was just a point A to B affair, its systems would become boring very quickly. In a way, a lot of what No More Heroes sets out to do in a gameplay sense could be seen as unambitious, which might be a bit disappointing for those who are looking to try it out for the first time. However, No More Heroes is at its best not when looking at the different facets individually, but taking a step back and viewing the experience as a whole. I like to compare this game a lot to Silent Hill 2. Sure, when looking at its systems on paper, it might look very unimpressive, especially in comparison to its contemporaries, but it's fit for purpose. Silent Hill 2 isn't trying to be the most mechanically demanding survival horror game on the market, and instead wants to intrigue players through its environmental design and story. Yeah, it's still a fun game, but it isn't the main appeal. If you're looking for mechanically complex survival horror, then you'd be better off going to Resident Evil than Silent Hill. The same can be said about No More Heroes. There are much better and more complex action games out there, but there aren't any other games that set out to do what NMH does and succeeds nearly as well, especially in how the narrative and gameplay intersects. No More Heroes, despite its laid-back and goofy attitude, is ultimately a character study about its main protagonist. Travis Touchdown is a slacker living in a big city who doesn't have much going for him. Sure, he's a professional hitman, but what does he do in between those jobs? What kind of life does he live? Well, the game takes ample time to demonstrate that. After every main mission, you end up back inside Travis's apartment where he receives a new bill to pay. From then on, it's back to the daily grind. Go out, find a job, get some money. It's not a permanent position, but it pays the bills for the meantime. Maybe at some point he'll have enough left over to buy some new clothes, or hit up the video rental store, but for the most part, his routine stays the same. A monotonous cycle that repeats day in, day out. Wake up, go to work, sleep, repeat. It's no wonder why Travis finds solace in the media he consumes. His apartment is decked out in merchandise of his favorite anime and video games. When he's not working, you can always find Travis sunk in his chair, his eyes glued to the TV, wasting away his days. It's a sad sight when you think about it, but can you really blame him? All that's waiting for Travis in the real world is a mind-numbing cycle of working the same job. It's not as if Travis has anyone he can confide in. Most of the people of Santa Destroy treat him like the shut-in creep that he is, and his only real friend is too busy to spend time with him. It's no wonder why Travis found comfort in his hobbies. Real life can suck, I'm pretty sure all of us can agree on that. And I'm also sure we've all used media as an escape from it all at some point or another. The difference is that Travis does this to an extremely unhealthy degree. Rather than building any real social skills, he instead opts to immerse himself in fantasy, to the point where he decides to reenact them in the real world. Travis wants to be like the characters that he idolizes on TV and in video games. This obsession is brought to the extreme when he decides to bite the bullet and become an assassin in order to satisfy those desires. It's the reason why Travis tries to act as cool as he does. He tries to mimic the mannerisms of a shonen anime protagonist, the cool suave hero with the vague goal of becoming number one. Despite how often he touts this as his main motivation, ultimately I think his reason for fighting comes down a longing for fulfillment. After living a life of mediocrity and loneliness, Travis yearns for one filled with excitement, whether that be through status, sex, or most importantly, violence. Something that No More Heroes makes abundantly clear is that the lifestyle of an assassin isn't something you should be striving for. No matter how you slice it, you can't just start killing people or seeking violence for some noble cause because the act itself stems from a desire to harm others. While Travis does have his own faux samurai code, it comes off as very self-righteous. It's not even as if the game itself tries to pretend that Travis is a good person. It's not an Uncharted situation, where Nathan Drake can kill basically anyone while still being seen as the hero. It's the reason why No More Heroes is as violent as it is. Recreating some video game fantasy in the real world isn't going to end with you getting the girl or saving the day. It'll be violent, disturbing, and filled with consequences. The other assassins that Travis comes across helps give us some extra perspective on this. Most of them have been doing this gig longer than he has, so these small interactions before the fight are used to show us the toll this lifestyle has taken on them. Some people, like Dr. Peace, have become isolated since his wife divorced him and is estranged from his daughter. Speedbuster has been forced to fight until she's grown old and unable to keep up with the next generation. Bad Girl has become completely desensitized from the killing. She treats her job as an assassin like someone would treat a regular paying job. You have no right to look at me like that. It's just a job. The Daily Grind. 
And you know what? She brings up a good point. As the game goes on, you wonder why Travis even continues down this path. Does he even enjoy it anymore? Or has this escape become so ingrained into his life that it's another part of his day? The excitement and thrill that once came with being an assassin is dried up by the end of the game. He puts in all of this effort into becoming number one, and what does he get out of it? Nothing. He gets scammed out of his money, is forced to fight and kill his half-sister, and is now a target for anyone looking to take his rank. Once all the momentary thrills are gone, not much has really changed. He still goes back to his apartment and waits for his next job, even more isolated than he was before. The core of No More Heroes is focused on critiquing the standard hero's fantasy. This is done a lot in the game's narrative, but it's also implemented into the game in more subtle ways. The UI has this retro pixel art feel to it. It's a cool stylistic choice on its own, but it's also a fun narrative detail when you relate it back to the story. Travis is a huge gamer, so it makes sense for him to try to gamify his real life. Stuff like ranking himself on the jobs he does, and viewing his victories over the assassins as getting a new high score. This next one might be a bit of a stretch, but I think it's worth talking about. The soundtrack of No More Heroes is pretty good. It's got a lot of techno and punk rock influence. One of my favorite details is the light motif that plays during regular stages. You know the one. This song is remixed throughout the game, and while some people might just write it off as a fun fact, I actually think it holds a lot more meaning. This song is meant to be Travis's theme, and the first time we're exposed to it is at the start of the game, where we hear him whistle it outside of his apartment. This implies that this is a song that Travis made up himself. It's meant to be his hype music, the hero's triumphant main theme that plays whenever they kick ass. It's no wonder why this motif is only used during the main missions. At this point, he's the center of attention, but whenever a boss battle starts, the stage theme is replaced by a unique theme for each assassin. Travis goes from thinking only about himself to carefully studying his opponent, turning this into a battle for the spotlight, and only one is able to make it out alive. Again, it might be a bit of a stretch, but it's some food for thought. So the next time you play Super Mario World and hear the Overworld theme remixed, just know that it's because Mario is an actual psychopath. The last thing that I want to talk about is a question that's proposed by the game's story. A few times in the game, Travis talks about wanting to find the exit to paradise. There is no direct answer as to what exactly he means by this. It's purposefully vague so that players can come to their own conclusions. But what the hell, let's give it a shot. As I've been discussing throughout this video, escapism is the core of No More Heroes, and paradise is in reference to that. Not in the sense of a momentary reprieve from hardship, but being able to escape your own life. This is something that Travis desires at the start of the game. He believes that his assassin lifestyle is the key to achieving paradise, though, as he quickly finds out, it's the exact opposite. During the boss fight against Death Metal, Travis realizes that he might have been a bit too hasty to dive headfirst into this new position, but by the time he's come to terms with this, it's too late for him to turn back. He desperately wants to find the exit to paradise, but no matter how hard he looks, he can't find that exit. All that awaits Travis in his life is a never-ending series of trials and bloodshed. Once he becomes the number one assassin, there's nothing left for him to do aside from more fighting. Every day, more rookies will come knocking at his door, looking to take that title for themselves. Accomplishing his goals didn't fix his life, it actually made it worse. However, now that Travis is at the top, he realizes that there is no way out. Paradise in the context of this game is meant to be symbolic of heaven, and if Travis wants to find that exit, then he's going to have to die. This is something that Travis has come to terms with, but that doesn't mean he's going to go out without a fight. It's kind of funny looking back at the ending of the first No More Heroes in retrospect. Nowadays, No More Heroes is an ongoing franchise with multiple installments that continue Travis's story. While I like those games well enough, there's just something so final about the ending of the first entry that feels a bit diminished with follow-ups. I get that this ending was intentionally ambiguous, but I always leaned on the side that Travis was supposed to die after his final fight. It would have served as some dramatic irony. Someone who found an escape through killing would eventually succumb to the cycle himself, finding that paradise that he longed for in his death. You can at least still look at this ending in a vacuum if you really want to, but it just sticks out as odd compared to the other games in the series. No More Heroes is one of my favorite games. I loved it back when I first played it, and I appreciate it even more nowadays. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. There's a lot you can criticize about No More Heroes in a gameplay sense, 
The combat can be kind of shallow and button mashy, the open world is a bit bare, and the mandatory grinding can be repetitive. I can see why people would be turned away from this game because of it, but niche games like this shouldn't be overlooked because of their flaws. Not all art has to be perfect to be considered a masterpiece, and I think that No More Heroes is worthy of that title. There's no other game out there on the market that captures the same feeling this one does. It's a deeply personal game that manages to express its main themes through the narrative and the core gameplay. It works to fully immerse the player in the role of its protagonist, and the social commentary that comes with it is top notch. However, despite the heavy subject matter, No More Heroes still manages to have fun with itself. It provides something for both the casual player looking for a good time and the crowd that appreciates a thought provoking experience. Our video games art, when talking about No More Heroes, that answer is absolutely. Mr. Touchdown, please wire the money as soon as possible, or something unfortunate may happen. Go! Oh! Ah! Sonic Sword! Holy... Ah! Ah! Hey, you know what paradise is, right? This is no paradise. Alright, then what is it? A place to die. I will let you in on a secret. Assassins must die when they lose. Open your eyes and never look back. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these lovely people that I'm able to make videos at the pace I do currently. These videos take a while to make, so if you're at all interested in helping out and donating, you can do so through my Patreon or channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access, a special Discord role, and even some behind the scenes content on occasion. Every donation helps, and if the rewards I mentioned sound interesting to you, then you can find out more by following the links in the description. This video has been a bit of a passion project for me for a while now. Believe it or not, most of this footage was recorded about two years ago, back when the Switch version of this game came out. But back then, I was struggling a bit as to what I wanted to talk about, so I shelved the video for a bit. Though just recently, it sort of just came to me exactly what I wanted to talk about, and I'm glad I finally bit the bullet and did it. I'm not sure if I'm going to cover the other three games or any of the other games Suda has made, but only time will tell on that. In terms of future projects, it's sort of up in the air right now as to what I'll be covering next. It's either going to be a DMC game or a Strange Journey, not going to make any promises. As always, if you want to stay up to date with future videos, feel free to follow my Twitter and join my Discord server. Both will be linked in the description. Once again, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.